Hello, my name is Will Stroll. I'm one of the sales engineers at .NET New Corporation. This is the sixth video in my series of videos that are covering presentations and being a speaker. In this one, I'll be talking about the top 10 best practices that you can do before, during, and even after a webinar. This video is not going to review any of the presentation related best practices though. Uh, those are available in a previous video, uh, well a couple of them, and I highly recommend those to you as well uh, to help you build the best presentations for your webinar. Uh, so uh, you probably should even watch those before this one. Now probably first and foremost you need to make sure that you have a good quality internet connection. Many people take this for granted only to find out that quality is an issue during the webinar. And of course, at that point, it is way too late. Wireless connections can be flaky at best, even today. Yeah, even in the best environments I've been in, I've seen quality issues come and go during a webinar or an online meeting. Uh, so wireless should be a last resort. A wired connection is not really a preference either. It should be viewed as an absolute requirement. A wired connection has much more bandwidth for your screen and for both inbound and outbound sound and of course for all the other features that your webinar software needs in order to be able to function without any quality issues. Now even if you stream music and video every day it's not a good idea to just assume that you have enough bandwidth. Find out what the minimum recommended bandwidth is for your webinar software and see how that stacks up against what you actually have available in your environment, whether that be at work or at home. You can easily find out what the minimum recommended bandwidth is for uh, in the documentation or FAQs that are provided by your webinar software vendor. And if you're not familiar with FAQ, that's just frequently asked questions. Now, testing before the webinar is a fantastic idea, and it is an absolute best practice. Not only should you do it ahead of time to gauge if you need to purchase more bandwidth, but you should also do it about an hour or two prior to your webinar as well. This allows for enough time to contact your internet provider to troubleshoot any bandwidth issues ahead of time, and this could uncover other needs as well. Now in corporate environments, it's not uncommon for many people to be streaming music and video during the workday, and there isn't anything wrong with that. However, during a webinar, this could impact the amount of bandwidth that you get during your webinar. So it might be a good idea to contact your network administrators to build in quality of service preferences for the webinar software, or just let everybody know not to do any of those streaming activities during the time that you are uh, broadcasting. Uh, obviously, some people listen better than others, though. Now, sound is one of the most critical components that can make up any type of broadcast, and a webinar is no different. Even movies lose all impact when sound, sound quality or decisions are, are not made uh, properly. First and foremost, make sure that you can broadcast from a sound-safe room. This room needs to allow uh, your own sound to be broadcasted without echo or distortion, but more importantly, it needs to also block sound from outside of the room. Offices and conference rooms are often great places for a webinar to take place in. Uh, when choosing your room, just be sure that there are no windows for people to distract you through, and make sure you're comfortable. You don't want to be halfway through your broadcast and sweating because your meeting room has no ventilation, as an example. Um, so it, it will impact your presentation. Now headsets are a critical component to have the most consistent and highest quality natural sound possible. They are built to recognize and properly broadcast voice. Speaker phones and onboard audio and laptops are not as well suited because they are not built to optimize for the human voice and they are very robotic and, and have an unnatural echo. Uh, so many attendees will judge you if your sound isn't coming through as natural and others might think that that it's not being prepared for sound and, and that it's a reflection of you and, and maybe even your product or your service. A quick side note about headsets though. If for some reason you have no choice but to use wireless internet connection for your webinar, it is absolutely not a good idea to broadcast both your audio and your screen from the same computer. You are almost guaranteed to have quality issues as the screen and audio will compete for each other for bandwidth. Of course, testing your sound is critical. Uh, you can have coworkers help uh, help you by maybe having a practice session in your same office.
but it's an even better idea to enlist a friend from across the country or maybe even in another country to ask them for how your uh, audio sounds. Uh, and this is a great time to know any specific issues and adjustments that you need to make before your live broadcast. Uh, this is especially important if you get a new microphone or a new headset. Sound quality and sound levels will potentially be different on every single one of them. This best practice should go without saying, but you absolutely should join your webinar early. Depending on the webinar software you're using and how you're using it, attendees can tell if you're there or not. It always sets a better tone for the webinar and for what you're representing if they join after you do. Uh, if they have to wait for you, your audience generally doesn't look upon this as a positive sign. Now you should join your webinar and show that you're online no less than five minutes prior to the scheduled start time. If you can, ten minutes is great too. Uh, you're going to find that you, you might even have attendees waiting for you if you're already ten minutes early before the broadcast time. Uh, as you approach your broadcast time, be sure to give regular audible cues that you're there and how much time do they have left. Remember that in webinars, your audience is probably not just sitting there waiting for you. They're, they are multitasking. They're looking at email, talking to coworkers, and much more. In any case, uh, they are probably not even looking at your webinar view or even at the time. So this audible cue will continue to give them an idea of when they have to join. It's a great idea to uh, instill some personality into this too. For example, if they have five minutes left, maybe suggest that they go and grab a cup of coffee before the webinar begins. One of the best things about starting early is that it allows you to cover any final prep without interruption prior to going live with your broadcast. Uh, this should, uh, or this could, uh, be opening files, talking to co-presenters, co or more. I, I generally like to get into my meeting space about 30 minutes prior to allow for some uh, reaction time for anything that may go wrong during setup. Uh, this allows. Uh, this also allows you to avoid the rush as a presenter. Uh, you don't want to begin a presentation after rushing to get everything set up. It's not a good thing. Uh, so starting one minute late is our, always a great idea, assuming you got there early. Uh, this all. This always allows people like that one last minute to install any prerequisite software for the webinar, and it also allows you to account for any straggler stragglers that may have a clock that is, is behind or you know a minute behind yours especially. Uh, so starting any later than that though would look unprofessional especially if you didn't get to the webinar screen started early. Now recording your webinar has numerous benefits and, and nearly no downside. If planned and executed properly your recorded webinar can be much more powerful and useful to you than the live broadcast. I'm just going to assume that you always plan on recording your webinars anyway. It's generally a no-brainer. Uh, when you put together your abstract and, and your advertisements for your webinar, you should not mention a single word about recording on purpose. Uh, do not give any excuse to potential attendees that may allow them to not show up. A typical scenario is, is one where a person might fully intend to go to a webinar, but they choose to do something else instead because they know a recording is going to be made. Uh, they still intend to watch the recording even, but it's no longer a priority. And in this scenario, very few people return to the recording on their own. It's a fact. And it's, it's not a good idea to mention a recording at the beginning of your webinar either, and for the very same reasons. People will feel much more compelled to stay through the duration of the webinar if they don't know if it's being recorded. If they know it's being recorded, then there's an even greater chance that they can be pulled away to a meeting or any number of other tasks. Uh, recording webinars are great for ongoing marketing campaigns, sales and marketing tools, and for search engine optimization. Uh, they allow you to have a more meaningful content hosted on your site that gives more reasons for your visitors to stick around. Uh, this can be great for building up leads or simply wrapping branding. Either way, your site traffic and an interest in your site, your site content, will go up. Uh, this is the intent of nearly any website. Now, depending on the software, uh, webinar software you use, uh, you will need to re-encode your video to make it distributable to your site or other sites. And encoding is, is just a technical way of, of describing the process of making your video compatible for playing by others on their own video players. 
If your webinar software doesn't include tools to make this possible, Microsoft Expression Encoder has a free and paid version that both uh, make re-encoding your, your video very easy. When you're uh, ready to make your recording available to people, it is okay to host it in your own video library or on paid services like Brightcove. Uh, however, you do miss out on the opportunity to be able to reach uh, potentially millions of visitors on the more popular video hosting and, and sharing services like YouTube and, and Vimeo. Uh, these sites are, are built specifically to help visitors discover, share, and interact with videos that are uploaded by people just like you. Uh, if your videos are not hosted there, you should have a very compelling business reason for missing out on that opportunity. Dual monitors can be intimidating for those that have never used them before, but once you go with two monitors, you will quickly want more. They are great, not only for webinars, but also for everyday work activities. Imagine working on one monitor and having your email or a Twitter client in the other. This allows you to be productive in a workspace on one screen while still being able to keep an eye on other things on the other screen. The same principle applies to your webinar. You can broadcast the entire screen of one monitor during your webinar while working in the other one. Many of you uh, may not know, but one of the most powerful features in PowerPoint and certainly one of my favorite features is something called presenter mode. This allows you to show your screen on show your slides on one screen while being able to look at your slide notes and upcoming slides and more on the other screen. Uh, this is incredibly helpful for any presentation, but especially in a webinar where you don't necessarily need one-on-one -on -one eye contact with audience members. The additional workspace offered by having this additional monitor has many other benefits as well, including having more workspace. Whether or not you're in PowerPoint, you now have a place to have notes open in front of you, uh, an outline or script, and a place to manage the webinar control panel without your attendees having to watch your mouse move around on a transparent application. That's, this can be an area where you have other applications or files open as well, and when you need them, simply drag them to the monitor you're currently broadcasting from. This also lessens the potential for distractions. If you have to uh, open a program, search for a, a file, or have an unavoidable notifications popping up, these can all show on your primary monitor while you show your audience the secondary monitor. Uh, basically, you just show them what they need to see and avoid distracting your attendees with anything that doesn't add value to their time spent with you during a webinar. Uh, this is an area that is relatively new to me. Uh, I've traditionally always executed webinars on my own. Uh, once you know what you're doing, it's, it's very e easy to be able to do that. However, having a team of people behind you uh, to help you with all the tasks is incredibly powerful. Whether or not you realize it, it allows you to deliver a much more powerful webinar than you could ever hope to do on your own. When you have a team helping with the small things, you inherently have a smoother flow. You are no longer managing attendees in the webinar control panel while going over a talking point, or managing an audio connection while trying to demonstrate a website. Someone can do the management of things that are known or, or that come up, and then you can just be the presenter. It is really nice to, to only have the burden of the presentation itself. You can focus a lot more on slide quality, hitting your talking points, and other very important duties as the presenter. Uh, you know, things such as your speed, speech patterns, and demonstrations. When you have people helping you, you would ideally have the same people doing the same things on every webinar broadcast. There is an immediate benefit to this. The more a person performs any task, the more familiarity, familiarity they build with those tasks and the smoother they execute them in the future. It also nearly eliminates the possibility for mistakes in the future. It's important to assign tasks to the people around you. Uh, uh, assign them in, in a common sense way that matches up with uh, people with tasks that make sense to them and their skill set and what they're capable of. Be especially judicious if they're going to co-present with you or be on the broadcast for anyone to see or hear. Uh, some people are much more suited to presentations and broadcasts than others. Uh, some of the things that you might want people to do is moderate in the event that you uh, have in front of uh, have a panel of presenters. You might want someone uh, well qualified answering questions live. This can be done through the webinar control panel or live during the broadcast itself. Uh, something that may not be immediately intuitive for you in this scenario is that the presenter should not be the main organizer of the webinar. 
someone else should be, and the presenter should be given the ability to share their screen. This is one of the many reasons to watch the control panel that your webinar software has. Uh, while your audience won't see the control panel itself, you can, and when it gets in the way, it's distracting. Anything distracting for either the presenter or the audience is not a good thing. However, your, your control panel is important. It tells you a lot about what's going on and gives you ways to react to it. Sometimes you cannot avoid it, but if you are the person that is currently broadcasting the screen, do your best not to fiddle with the control panel while showing your screen. If it is on a screen that is not broadcast, then it can be okay, but it takes a seasoned webinar presenter to do this without the audience realizing it or wondering what's going on. Uh, if you have anyone at all to help you, uh, have, the, have them help you manage the things going on in the control panel. Nothing is more distracting than to watch somebody mess with the control panel that the audience cannot see, and then listen to their broken speech as they fix whatever went wrong. Uh, let somebody else that is not broadcasting manage the control panel. Depending on your webinar and the software you use, there may be multiple people helping you with that. When managing a control panel, you need to be extremely alert for any issues that may arise. These issues could be as bad as a screen not showing, bandwidth or audio issues, or simply responding to live feedback from attendees. The most important point on this topic is knowing the features of the control panel. This is critical to being effective with your webinar. You need to know when and how to show your screen. You need to know when and if your screen or sound is broadcasting. If something goes wrong, you need to be informed enough to be able to recover from it immediately and when possible without the audience even realizing it. Nothing is more professional than being able to recover gracefully from an issue. If your audience noticed at all, they will have a lot more respect for you uh, for it versus not recovering well at all. Uh, do everything in your power to familiarize yourself with all of the features of the control panel so that your webinar is not only successful, it's also not a train wreck. Feedback can be incredibly useful during and after your webinar. It's the best way to gauge how things are going and to improve the quality of your webinar. If you don't ask for it, you probably won't get it. The most common way to get people engaged in your webinar and get their attention immediately is to ensure that the broadcast is error free. Ask them if they can hear you. Have them use whatever feedback mechanism that your software offers. In GoToWebinar, it allows attendees to raise their hands. You know, once you verify that people can hear you, ask if they can see your screen okay. It is best to use a slide for each of these so that way they can describe or that you can describe what they are supposed to see versus what was already shown. This is uh, what I often use. It allows me to describe a tree and ask them if they see it. If they don't see a tree, then the broadcast didn't continue showing my screen past the previous slide. If you switch screens or start showing a different application, it's a great idea to ask for feedback again to see if the new application or screen is being shown to your audience. Your audience is usually pretty eager to participate, so don't be afraid to ask. The most obvious kind of feedback is for you to find out after the webinar if your audience felt it was worth their time and, and to give feedback on any new topics or areas that you can improve on. Every presentation and webinar should have some Q&A. This is part of the value of attending live. Attendees have the opportunity to listen to a subject matter expert, learn something, but also to ask a question have an, and have an immediate response. This part of your presentation should be built in and allow for no less than 10 minutes at the end of your presentation to answer questions from the audience. It generally isn't a great idea to hold a webinar where the audience is allowed to be heard during the presentation. This makes things completely difficult to manage. Instead, ask your attendees to use the question asking tools in the webinar software to ask their questions. Let them know where and how to do that in the beginning of your presentation. Also, be sure to let them know that you'll be answering all of the questions that you can at the end of the webinar. This gives them another reason to stick around. Uh, when you get into the Q&A part of the webinar, you won't always have questions waiting for you. In a few cases, I've even had webinars where no one asked a single question. And for these reasons, it's an absolute best practice to have a couple of anticipated questions queued up and ready for you to answer. 
I would ask, I, I would suggest rather, having no more than five seed questions ready. This allows you to also spark the curiosity of your attendees to get them to ask questions related to maybe your seed questions or give them a little bit more of confidence to ask their own. When answering questions, be sure to repeat the questions that are asked. All too often, you'll have questions that are not written very eloquently as well. So instead of reading some of those questions word for word and embarrassing the person that asked it, it's, it's a better idea to summarize the question in a more clear way. Also, don't skip questions that, you, uh, that were asked about something you showed. Remember, not, the people that are watching are not paying 100% attention to you during a webinar. They are doing other things. They may have missed something you said, something you showed, or clicked on. Repeat it and answer it anyway. If all went well, you should have had a, a large audience and too many questions were asked for your, for your allotted time. When this happens, be sure to communicate that you will respond to and answer all questions via email after the webinar. And then do it. A best practice here would be to answer all questions within 24 hours. This shows that you valued the time that they had chosen to spend with you, and that has a personal touch that they will remember. Webinars don't uh, always need to feature a single presenter. Some of the better presenters will, will feature two or more people in a panel to discuss a topic from multiple viewpoints or, or two more people that specialize in different areas of the same topic to give a more complete insight into the subject matter. These kind of presentations can be the most valuable and, are a lot, and add a lot more credibility to your webinar program. It's a great idea to choose presenters not only from within your organization, but also from customers, partners, other vendors, and even other thought leaders. These tips assume that you are hosting your own webinar and inviting others to present alongside you. As the host, there should be specific expectations and quality controls that you have in place to protect you and the integrity of your webinar event. At the very beginning of the planning process, you will need to set a very clear expectation on who is to do what. Make sure everyone knows exactly what they're responsible for and put it in an email as well so that everyone not only hears it during a phone call, but it can then very easily be referenced when beginning uh, their prep for their portion. Now make sure that if there are multiple parties providing slides, you review them all to ensure that they meet your expectations and the bare minimum standard of what you want to present to your attendees. Remember, everything that your audience sees relays a certain level of endorsement from you, since you are the host. If a third party introduces horrible slides or cannot effectively speak during the presentation, this will reflect more poorly upon you than it will on them. Rehearse. I've said this before in previous ver videos, however this is not something that you should skip or take lightly when there are multiple presenters involved. You will need to go through all of the motions to make sure that everyone is familiar with the process and knows what to expect. Ensure that everyone knows how to perform and to accept a handoff gracefully, whether that handoff is verbal or through the webinar software. Sometimes it's a great idea to create a reusable handout that has a general expectations procedures on, procedures on it and make sure that everybody involved has a copy of it. The more people that you have contributing to a live webinar, the more potential you have for things going wrong. Now, you should do everything in your power to have a backup plan. This is part of what makes rehearsal so valuable. If their internet connection goes down or their computer crashes, how do you proceed? Have a, a plan uh, to react in a way that shows professionalism and value for your atten attendees. Make sure all parties have copies of the slides. Make sure that there is an opportunity to create or have on ready a recorded demo if necessary. These kinds of forward-thinking things will help to ensure that you make the best effort to have a positive impact and impression on the day for your attendees. After all, this positive impact will extend to your brand, your product, or your services. I know I told you I was going to give you 10 best practices for webinars, but I wanted to give you a bonus tip. It is important to keep the context of your webinar, the materials for the webinar, and the state of the attendees in mind when you're planning and executing a webinar. Those that do this right will have the best webinars around. Do it wrong and everyone will be talking about you for the wrong reasons, and nobody wants that. The attention span for anyone viewing anything online, even if it's live, is shorter. 
This is one of the many reasons why short videos are the most viral. It's quick and easy to digest. This also explains why you gain or lose a website visitor within the first few seconds of your page loading. Attention spans are shorter today than they ever have been before. You need to keep this in mind when creating a presentation anyway, but when you are broadcasting live over the web, this is a golden rule. Never schedule a webinar to last more than an hour. You need to have better vocal cues and tones to highlight good and bad. You need to make sure that highs and lows are built into your presentation, and you need to build up to something. If the overall feel of your webinar is very monotone or uninteresting, you will lose a lot of attendees before the webinar is over. Remember that you, your attendees are also distracted. They may not even be looking at your screen. They may have received a phone call, started working an email, or any other number of things that happen daily in our workplace. They are distracted. Keep your presentation as interesting as possible with case studies, recognizable brands, useful st statistics, and meaningful high quality graphics. Also, build in pauses. Believe it or not, a long pause will bring someone back to the webinar screen. If uh, They will wonder if their sound has an issue, or if the webinar had an issue, or if it ended. You shouldn't just be silent for the sake of being silent, but a long pause for a point to sink in is great. A great example of when to allow for this is a transition from a slideshow to a software demonstration. There is no need to fill in the empty air during that transition. As a presenter, the hardest role to learn is that time moves much more quickly when you are the person presenting. Time moves incredibly fast. As a result, many presenters end up speaking and moving too quickly. And during a webinar, this is much more apparent to the audience and it becomes a much bigger problem. Uh, make a conscious effort to slow down and don't load too much content into the presentation to make you feel like you have to rush. Instead, have more webinars and slow down. The greatest gift that you can give to anyone in the business world is time. Uh, don't try to cram so much material into an hour that you always fill up the entire hour. If you are scheduled for an hour, create enough content to fill 45 or 50 minutes. And then plan to use the rest of your hour for Q&A. If you don't have enough questions for the final 10 minutes, then give them back. Your audience will love, them, love you for it.